Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Lewandowski, and uh, as part of the ECHO project today, we're going to be talking about uh, sleep and pain. And uh, we have our, our, our panel. Uh, uh, we've got Paul over here, a licensed uh, uh, counselor and alcohol abuse counselor, and of course, Dr. Dennis Patterson, pain management. And we have the pleasure today of, uh, of having Dr. Michael Lucia to, uh, here, who is uh, board certified in sleep, critical care, and in pulmonology. So he's uh, very well versed uh, in the area of sleep medicine, uh, sleep issues, and has a, uh, always had an interest in people with chronic pain, since that's one of the typical uh, uh, issues that are presented to him. So uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have him today, and I'd like to, uh, to maybe turn it over. And of course, hopefully you have some questions, some cases to present, uh, or issues that uh, revolve around pain and sleep because we have a wonderful panel for you today. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I'll start with a case, case example. Uh, I have a patient, uh, he has a condition, uh, gout, which is a frequent painful condition, uh, flares periodically. And uh, when it does, people often complain that the, the attacks occur in the middle of the night, often about three in the morning. And that's usually when they came instead of you know, a bed sheet touching the toe or the ankle or wherever it's flaring. And when that happens, they definitely don't sleep well. They start taking pain medications. Those pain medications often cause increased uh, problems with sleep and daytime hangover effects. And that leads to loss of productivity. And the chronic sleep deprivation leads to fibromyalgia-like symptoms and trouble concentrating, pain in the shoulders and the neck. And I'm telling you all this because that's been my week. So the last five days, I've gotten about four to five hours of sleep a night at best because my gout attack occurred Saturday morning, and uh, it's been a rough week since then. So it's just uh, as I was getting up this morning, you know, climbing on the bed again, I said, well, it's a good thing we're talking about pain and sleep. And I can use my, myself as a case example this morning for the panel. So uh, I have more empathy for my patients when these things occur. So, but what I do see is, is a tremendous amount. You know, we obviously have an opioid crisis in northern Nevada and nationwide. And we also have an epidemic of sleep apnea and sleep disorders in this country. And they certainly coincide. And many of the patients that, that get to me in clinic have both chronic pain issues and often depressive or anxiety or bipolar issues combined with their sleep disorder. And they, they kind of go hand in hand. And so symptoms of depression, anxiety, bipolar, you name it, often are sleep deprivation, early morning awakenings, insomnia. And then those patients get started on the road to taking sedatives and things like trazodone and so forth that then lead to daytime hangover effects. And we get into this cycle of debilitation um, and their sleep patterns become extremely deranged over time. And that's independent of whether they have sleep apnea or not, and many of them do. And what we also find is many of the meds that are prescribed for their pain issues, including narcotics, muscle relaxers, soma, gabapentin, all these drugs, increase the likelihood of not only additional sleep disorders, and disruption of REM cycles and so forth, but it, it, the muscle relaxant effect and the narcotic anti-respiratory uh, effect, the depressive effect, induces more snoring and sleep apnea and central apnea. So almost 20% of the patients we see now in our sleep clinic have a mixed obstructive and central sleep apnea problem from medications and heart failure and other causes too, but mostly medication effects. So and that becomes a much more difficult thing to treat. So. One of the biggest challenges I face in clinic every day is trying to not only treat people's airway problem with you know, CPAP or other types of airway uh, pressure, but trying to modify their medication regimen or reduce or eliminate uh, a lot of the medications that are inducing a lot of problems. Right, so just be aware that you know, almost every medication you can prescribe has some effect on sleep, either on the pattern of sleep or suppression of REM, such as antidepressants, or inducing more sleep disorders like sleep apnea, uh, with the respiratory suppression effect uh, and trying to minimize those, especially at bedtime or in the late evening hours, uh, is really got to be a part of the strategy because otherwise it doesn't matter what I do with CPAP or you know, putting them on airway pressure if their pattern of sleep is totally deranged or they're sleeping all day because they're on gabapentin and can't stay awake, then they're not going to sleep at night. And so the circadian rhythm disorders also become a huge part of the pain management uh, problem. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, you know, being a pain specialist, I see patients all the time. So they'll come to me, and um, a lot of times they are on like Xanax, um, Clonopin, 
um, you know, medications or Ambien, and usually when I tell them, hey, the combination of pain medications, well, one, I always tell them that their pain medications are probably causing fragmented sleep cycles. Right. And I talk to them about, you know, reducing or coming off the pain medications. But to them, that seems crazy. I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, if anything, they need a higher dose or another pain medication to take in the middle of the night because it's you don't get it, doc. It's the pain that's causing my sleep problems. And if I could just wake up at 2 and take another pain pill, um, I would be fine. And then, you know, then to get them to wrap their head around that the combination of the two medications is life-threatening, essentially. Um, how, you know, what strategies do you utilize to, you know, make patients understand that's what's ongoing? Because, I, you know, I, I can't seem to break that barrier talking to them about it. Well, I mean, I, I cite, you know, examples from the media, you know, things like the, the actor Heath Ledger who overdosed and, and, and you know, killed himself with a combination of mostly benzos, pain meds, and Ambien. Uh, and I tell them that these drugs by themselves, if you take only Ambien by itself, you can't die from overdose or it's not that dangerous. But if you take it with a combination of other drugs, benzodiazepines in particular and narcotics, that the, the risk is tremendous. And I didn't give them a handout from even Consumer Reports has a health newsletter and there was two articles in the last year about the dangers of sleep aids. And it's written at a fifth grade level, and it's directly to patients. And I give them a copy of that. And this, you know, this shows that not only are these drugs not effective in the long term, and that's the point. I say, I tell them things like Ambien and Nesta and Balsamra really don't improve sleep. They give you amnesia for the awakenings. Yeah. So you don't remember being awake, but on average, you get less than 20 minutes of additional sleep when you take the drugs chronically than if you don't. Less than 20 minutes. Less than 20 minutes. So if you want to spend $3 to $6 a pill, Increase your risk of dementia, your risk of hip fracture, falls, pneumonia, aspiration. And I go through the litany of risk. Yeah. And saying so when you combine it with narcotics and benzos, those risks are even that much higher. Yeah, but, you know, yeah, but I find the when you mentioned the dementia, the risk of dementia, that's an easy sell in an older patient because many people have that as a very deep seated fear. And so dementia hits some of the patients. Absolutely. Dementia, and I think the ones that are most have the most impact is risk of dementia, risk of falls, and hip fracture. And so uh, I tell them that we have data that clearly shows those risks are marked increased and Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases. But the risk of those is markedly increased if you take these meds, especially chronically in a combination. And just this week, you know, I saw a patient back who had been diagnosed with dementia and put on dementia medications, Namenda. And when I looked at his list, he was on five neuro-affecting drugs, trazodone. Clonopin, uh, I can't remember, one narcotic, uh, Soma, and one of the gabapentin. And then he was not treated for sleep apnea, which of course was severe, especially with all those meds on board. So his apnea index was almost 80 an hour, and I stopped, oh, he was taking Benadryl with cap too. So I stopped all five of those sedating medications and treated him and did a split night study for him on CPAP. And in less than six weeks, his cognitive function is normal. Hmm. And that's what you don't have dementia. You were just pharmacologically induced dementia is what you had. Hmm. And it would become permanent or lead to you know, real dementia if we didn't reverse this. So yeah, it's, a, it's an easy sell when I start talking about the fact that even pain specialists know that if you increase the dose of pain medicines above the therapeutic threshold, it actually increases pain yeah. and side effects. Yeah. And like, really? I can I can make my pain worse by taking more? Yeah. Yes. And so uh, there's a lot of different ways I, I approach it depending on the age of the patient and how long they've been on the meds, and then just trying to get them to taper. We go, okay, we won't stop. Let's just try to cut half. Let's try to go to every other night. Let's try to do half a dose of ambience and sure a female, and that's all you should ever take. Mm -hmm. So you know, there, there are a lot of different kind of outcomes measures that I use to try to convince patients, especially if they already have some of these other problems like Parkinson's or impaired mm -hmm. you know, cognition. So that, that, I think, is the most successful. So you said there's articles in Consumer Health Report? Yeah, Consumer Reports has a health newsletter. And I recommend it to all patients because it's extremely helpful. In fact, I gave it as yeah. gifts yeah. to a lot of my friends this year. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it's super it's easy. Really I was just looking at it this morning. There was an article on ways to reduce the cost of health care. I had like 30 tips on how you could lower the cost of care. And uh, you know, I share those with patients all the time. But there were two one-page articles about the dangers of sleep medicine. And in fact, last month's regular Consumer Reports issue, the whole cover story was on sleep. The whole cover story was on sleep. Everything from medications to buying the right mattress to sleep hygiene habits to diagnosing and treating sleep apnea. So it was about a 10, 12-page report 
just about problems with sleep since, again, there's such an epidemic of complaints. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 20% of Americans report chronic insomnia. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. And the prescribing of sedatives and the new generation of sedatives like Ambien, Lunesta, Belsamra, and so forth is, is a real problem. I mean, the opioid epidemic gets so much press right now, but sleep and <coughs> prescribing epidemic for sleep, I think, is just as bad. Mm -hmm. So I see, you know, uh, you know, one, it seems like I kind of end up being the dumping ground for fibromyalgia patients because rheumatology won't see them. You know, oh, we, it sounds like they got fibromyalgia, their lab work is negative, we're not going to see them. And then kind of, you know, the kind of the oil drip pan ends up being pain management. And, you know, those patients come to, come to me and then I see that they're also on like methadone or oxycodone for breakthrough. And then I have that hard time trying to talk to them about how, you know, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, you know, fibromyalgia is not a condition where opiates should be prescribed. And I try to talk to them about weaning off, and I talk to them about their sleep cycles, low, you know, aerobic exercise programs that are sub-threshold so they don't overdo it. Correct. And, you know, since they've been on these pain meds for years, it's a very hard cycle um, to beat and even to convince them to go get a sleep right. study right. Is, is a is a hard thing to to convince them of. Oh, I don't need. I, I can't go there. I won't be able to sleep. Right. I'm going to connect right. me to wires. Right. I mean, what are your strategies with these patients? Well, a lot of times, I mean, number one, we often if they have a long history of insomnia, I, I tell them we can do a home study. So over half, two thirds of our sleep studies now we do at home. Okay. So that allows the patient to at least sleep in their own bedroom, in their own environment, and not have to deal with. But if there's many things hooked up to them, we only have a limited number of channels when we do home studies. But when we do home studies, we can't measure sleep. We're only measuring apnea, air, you know, SATs, EKG, things like that. But at least it's a start. Because if I get a home study, it shows they have you know, very severe sleep apnea, which you know, the data on fibromyalgia is pretty strong both directions. So if you take, like I indicated with my own personal example, if you sleep deprive somebody even three to five nights in a row, mm -hmm. they develop fibromyalgia type symptoms. It's been documented over and over. If you just deprive them selectively of stage three sleep, within a week, fibromyalgia type complaints, almost universally. Men, women, doesn't matter. Young, old, even 20-year-old healthy recruits in the military, they did this experiment on back in the 70s and 80s and showed this. And the flip side is true when people develop chronic pain, like fibromyalgia, if you look at their sleep patterns, they're very abnormal. They have reduced delta or slow wave sleep, the deep stages of sleep, they have reduced rhythm of sleep, and they have a lot of spontaneous arousal, and what we call alpha intrusion, which alpha waves are the waves of awake, which shouldn't be happening when they're asleep. We see them like little sparkles all through the EEG, just like static noise. And those are part and parcel tied to either anxiety or pain, and often fibromyalgia. And we know that the pain threshold, how much pain you're going to experience in shoulders, muscles, and fascial, myofascial pain is directly tied, and how you perceive the pain is directly tied to how much sleep you get. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, is fairly easy to sell to patients. And if you improve your sleep, both quality and quantity, you got to do both, your pain threshold improves. It goes up, and you can tolerate more pain. Your pain's still there, but you're going to perceive it less. Fewer signals are going to make it to your brain. It's going to be less debilitating. And when you look at the data on, again, any chronic pain population, including fibromyalgia, at least 40% have sleep apnea. Yeah. So when I say, if we do a sleep study, half the time I'm gonna find sleep apnea if I do no screening at all. Just like people walking into a cardiologist office. If you just did a sleep study, every person walking through the front door, 50% have moderate to severe sleep apnea yeah. with no screening whatsoever. No malapati score, no snoring, just do a sleep study every month. So if you pick your populations, you know, again, 20% to 30% of adult males have sleep apnea. If you start looking at chronic pain patients, it's at least 50%. And if you look at cardiology patients, 50%. If you look at you know, all these different, if you look at insomniacs, 50%. Either have that or possibly restless legs or PLMD. So I, I quote some of those numbers to try to tell patients, you know, this isn't rare. And if you have this, you probably have this. Yeah. And if we treat this, it could markedly improve your other quality of life issues, health issues, pain issues, need for medications, need for sleep aids. And our goal is to take things away. You know, your GERD gets better if I treat your sleep apnea, so we don't have to take the private sick. Yeah. And we don't have to take this. So my greatest accomplishment in clinic each day is when I can peel meds away yeah. because we treated the causes of symptoms rather than treating symptoms. More is not better. Correct. And that, that appeals to most patients. Very few yeah. patients are not amenable to taking less. What, now, if you get somebody to commit to this, what time frame are we looking at? Are you looking at four to six weeks for their symptoms? Yeah, yeah, I mean, sleepiness, we, we give them kind of a timeline. You know, things like sleepiness improve within days. 
if you start with CPAP therapy and start treating your sleep apnea. Things like you know muscle pain and aches and so forth. It takes a while for the sleep patterns to be restored, especially if the meds are still on board, and if we have to gradually reduce those. Right. But um, at least six weeks. Things like cognitive function, usually about six to twelve weeks. Things like blood pressure improvements, we see about twelve weeks. Uh, at twelve plus weeks, we can see improvement in cardiac function if they're heart failure and things like that. Uh, so there's different timelines, and even short-term memory and long-term memory, we see improvements for up to six months to a year. Okay. Yeah, so, so I tell them there's going to be sort of like when you quit smoking. So, well, some things get better right away, some things get better in weeks, and, and others in months, and others in years in terms of cardiovascular risk, cancer risk, this kind of thing. And the same is true once you restore normal sleep. Yeah. And I can predict that better if I have a full sleep study in the lab on those patients because if we see them not only the apnea is gone or the leg movements, but if their sleep pattern is starting to return back to normal, that is much more predictive of, of better outcomes. Okay. If they're eight years old and we're trying to start with CPAP and they've had these problems for 50 years and you try to restore their sleep pattern, it's permanently altered and they don't get as much recovery and you don't see as much improvement. So early intervention yeah. is the key. So I mean, when you when your eyes get so many referrals, you know, patients 75 to 90 years old to start trying to sleep, treat their sleep apnea or sleep disorder at that age, it's very, very difficult. Because now they have chronic pain issues from arthritis, they have numerous learned bad behaviors, their sleep patterns are permanently altered, they often do have cognitive impairment and early forms of dementia, and it's very difficult to treat. When that went back to when they were in their 20s and 30s, yeah. that's when the apnea started, or the sleep disorder. Yeah. And if we catch it then, the drive to, for the brain to go back to a normal sleep pattern is much, much stronger. Okay. And we can use a restore that normal sleep pattern and then carry forward. You know, as a pain management psychologist, one of the biggest obstacles that I see in terms of introducing the idea of sleep is that, uh, uh, and, and that usually is the number one problem I see, a complaint besides depression, anger, and sleep, sleep problem. Uh, they say, well, but I don't snore, uh, right. so I don't need to go see a sleep medicine doctor or have a sleep study. So would you be able to help us understand maybe the difference between obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea, which the medications can kind of contribute to? Well, I mean... Some people, yeah. if they're not obese, then yeah. many patients don't snore who have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So 20 to 30% of patients with sleep apnea don't snore. And 20 to 30% of patients with sleep apnea have a normal BMI, especially younger patients. So it's a craniofacial problem. It's a large tongue, it's a small jaw, it's an assessed jaw, and most of that is congenital, and most of that is inherited. And if you ask one or both of their parents, probably have sleep apnea mm -hmm. and or siblings. So there's a familial history, a familial component to it. Like most sleep apnea, I think, has a food component. And then when I explain that most people know that if you take certain medicines, pain medicines in particular, morphine helps relieve shortness of breath. So it's, it, it suppresses respiration. And if you take enough during sleep, when you're dependent totally on the chemoreceptors to breathe, that you will have pauses in your breathing, we call central apneas. So even if there's no snoring, you may still have these long pauses where you don't breathe, and that your spouse or bed partner may hear you stop breathing even if you don't snore. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what was happening. But that central apnea still ends with an awakening, an arousal. Because mm -hmm. your stats are dropping, your CO2 is going up, and eventually you have to awaken yeah. partially to breathe. breathe that. Right. And then we can't really, and central apnea is very difficult to diagnose with home studies. Mm -hmm. So I do encourage, if I see somebody on chronic narcotics or other you know, drugs that are likely to do central apnea, I almost always recommend an in lab study mm -hmm. so that we can accurately measure centrals. Because you're likely to have at least 30 50 percent of their events will be central. So they're not able to be identified through a home study? Not, no. The centrals are very difficult yeah. to, to identify. You can suspect it, but it, most of the time it, it's very difficult to diagnose without seeing the effort belts and the brain waves together. Mm -hmm. Because you see no effort, and you see this long pause, and then you see the arousal, then you see the rest of the effort, and the airflow both improve. So it, it's tough without being able to see EEG. And we also see the other patterns that are consistent with abnormal sleep, including the spontaneous arousals, the alpha intrusion, these kinds of you know, common findings in chronic pain patients and opioid users <coughs> that you can see in the EEG. But if they want, because most of the patients are going to have obstructive apnea too. Mm -hmm. So if we do a home study first and it sees the obstructive events and gives me a score of 20 or 30 or 40 an hour, that still gives me enough information to coach the patient, yes, you do have this. And we need an in lab titration study at the very least, and then I can then get a look at their sleep, especially after I've treated the obstructive component. And then if the centrals persist, then we have to decide whether we're going to try a different type of CPAP therapy, a ventilator therapy, 
you know, called ASV or auto servo ventilator therapy. And that often requires, maybe we do it all one night, sometimes we have them back for the other night. But if we can treat the obstructive component and reduce their meds, especially close to bedtime, even if we don't stop them, just get the dose down and reduce the combination, polypharmacy at that time. And a lot of times the centrals will fade and we don't have to do another study. Uh, tell them that. So I'm not going to put you on OSV, a $4,000 ventilator machine in my to treat your centrals if I get rid of most of your centrals. Mm -hmm. If we get it down to under 10 to 15 an hour mm -hmm. and their symptoms are well controlled and their obstructive apnea is fully controlled, that's a reasonable outcome. Yeah. You know, just don't take you know, free normal right before bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, I, know, I know you use also some uh, risk factors uh, that, that, that helps you identify the potential for some problems. I'm not sure. Folks out there would love to know kind of the maybe the five, six, seven things you look for uh, that are identifiers well, of, of potential apnea. Well, I mean, a couple of years ago, it's about four or five years now, we, we put up a poster in each of the exam rooms. And the poster has a human figure and then it has all these different disorders and diagnoses. And on top of it is the consequences of untreated sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And then it has percentages. What percent of patients with sleep apnea will develop this, will develop this, will develop this? from hypertension to insomnia to mood disorders to dementia, you know, chronic cough, and I keep adding labels as more data comes out. And I, you know, the patient gets checked in, gets put in that room, and that poster sits right in their face. <laughs> and while they're sitting there waiting for me, they're reading all this stuff on this poster and looking at all these numbers, and they go, well, I have that, and I have that, and I have that, and I have that, and I have hypertension, I have diabetes, I have this, I have that. And then, you know, by the time I walk in the room with their sleep study results often, you know, they're already sold. They're already sold. Well, yeah. I already got half the stuff on that, that chart. Yeah. So, yeah. And then you have an apnea score of 50 an hour. You see the reason to treat now. So it really does help kind of bring it, personalize it, mm -hmm. and make it, a, a, and we're not talking about snoring and sleepiness anymore. Mm -hmm. We're talking about chronic disease states mm -hmm. and serious, you know, disease states, chronic AFib and so forth. And that becomes a much easier path to get compliance rather than, Talking about whether the bed partner is snoring or not, how sleepy they are during the day, because many people will deny the sleep pains, will deny a lot of the symptoms. But they won't, you know, we can't deny they have three blood pressure pills on board and they're taking Eloquist because they, they fit. And yeah. they don't want to be on those meds. They hate being on blood thinners. They hate this. Why, why is it on pressure control? Why did I have a stroke even though I controlled all my risk factors? Well, you didn't control them. Yeah. And so that, that, that is, and I have that poster up in the sleep lab, and I have that poster up in the PFT lab. So no matter where the patient's in there, they're looking at that poster. And I have one in the lobby, too. <laughs> so that I have found is very helpful to kind of, you've already got all this. Yeah. Or you know somebody who has all these problems, like your parents or somebody else, and you don't want to have the, all these things develop. This is one way to prevent it. And then I use the data, like an age study, the sleep heart health study, to show them why, why are the benchmarks what they are. Here are my benchmarks for treatment. you got to get at least six and a half hours of sleep on CPAP, at least 95% of nights used and an apnea score of less than five. And where do those numbers come from? I didn't just pull them out of thin air. They come from a 10 year study that showed if you get that level of usage of CPAP, that dose of CPAP, that your cardiovascular risk, your stroke risk, all of these risks, all that stuff on the poster is reduced back to that of someone who does not have CPAP. <laughs> so, yes, are there any questions uh, for Dr. Lucia on the topic of sleep and pain? Anybody have any cases out there they want to discuss? I have a question. Okay, so uh, when we have that combination of benzos and opioid therapy, do you have a, a strategy to either titrate both of those down or stop one or have the patient choose one or the other? Um, how do you deal with that combination? Because a lot of times by the time they get to see me, they're so reliant on uh, even perceiving something that might be uncomfortable that they automatically start reaching out. And that's the, the cycle begins. I would say when I see this combination of polypharmacy that so often occurs, I usually attack the sleep drugs first. I usually try to get them off the Ambien or the Munesta first, simply because they're very unsafe when used in combination. There's no question. Mm -hmm. And the risk of uh, falls, the risk of sleep driving, sleep eating, you know, all these bizarre behaviors that you read about, those are only going to happen when they mix these drugs with these other things. And I use those examples to say, you know, people have been found in their cars, you know, driving, you can get DUI for this, 
who had taken these combinations, you know, even if you took it last night, you were driving the next morning, it's still a board. So I try to get the sleep meds out first, or at least reduced or minimized. Uh, or used only PRN two nights a week, not every night. Then I usually attack the benzos next, rather than going into pain meds. Because the benzo effect on sleep is more profound. So benzodiazepines have more muscle relaxing effect, uh, as well as respiratory drive suppression. So you get collapse of the airway, you get more sleep apnea, you, you, there's just more problems, and it really suppresses deep sleep. So the benzodiazepines, I think, are more disruptive to sleep than even narcotics are. Yeah. So I kind of prioritize those first, and they're also less beneficial, again, in most cases. People are taking Soma and Flexeril and all these drugs long term, and the data clearly shows they don't benefit anyone long term, especially for chronic back pain. You know, short term, for spasm, they can be provide some temporary relief, but I tell them after five or seven days, it's useless to keep taking this drug. And you're also going to become very dependent and addicted to it, and then when you start to stop, you've got to taper it very slowly so you don't have rebound anxiety, rebound insomnia, rebound everything else. <laughs> so I usually have to taper that fairly slowly. And I often use Valium to try to provide a super long-acting benzo to, just like we do with methadone, give them a drug with a half-life of 72 hours to get them off the drug that has a half-life of two, like Xanax. And say, okay, you're not going to withdraw if you take five or ten of Valium a day, and you can take it in the evening to kind of help with sleep as we get the rest of your benzos reduced and eliminated. And then I can very gradually bring the Valium down and know that they're never going to have acute benzo withdrawal. Because if they miss a complete day, day or two of dosing, the are not going to withdraw. Right. Then I'll work on the narcotics. So kind of in that order, um, and then I try to reduce the dosing and what the timing of the dose is. So a lot of patients are taking gabapentin. I see it being used extensively now. In kind of, mm -hmm. Every other patient I've seen on gabapentin these days. And high doses, you know, three, four hundred, three, four 400, three, four times a day. And it's a profoundly sedating drug during the day. And you know, these patients are barely functional. And then it, there's, the sleep pattern is totally screwed up. And there's no data that says taking it QID is any better than taking BID or taking it all evening. So I basically try to take away the daytime doses and say, take your first dose at 5 p.m. when you get home and take two. You know, if you're going to take, you know, four or 300 milligrams, take two at 5 p.m. and two at 9 p.m. instead of all throughout the day. So just the chronotherapy, the timing of when they take their meds is also incredibly important to try to enhance the sedating effects when you want them to be there at night or during sleep and minimize them during the day so that they don't get into this total sleep-wake cycle disruption and napping and falling asleep throughout the day, especially patients who don't work or sit at home. They're going to sleep. They take those drugs, they're going to be sleeping in front of the TV and the couch at 3 in the afternoon and then there's no rhythm and there's no day or night cycle. So that's kind of been my approach is to you know, triage what's the most dangerous drug you are in the first and the least helpful. And clearly the sleep aids are the least helpful in this situation and definitely riskiest. And then I get to the benzos, then narcotics, and then try to adjust the dose in there. Even the neuropathic drugs like Lydia Lyrica and Gavapent. They also like Ambien comes in at 10 milligram dose. Do they have to take the whole 10 milligram dose? No, that's all. Can they take, uh, and it comes in fives too. Okay. Well, absolutely. Do they have to take the whole five? No, they, they, it comes in tens and fives, and both are pills that can be broken in half. And so I tell patients that the dose for women is absolutely recommended to be no more than five. No more than, no more than five, mm -hmm. ever. Even in a young woman. So women don't metabolize this nearly as fast. And so the FDA came out with that. It's a black box warning right on the side of the, on the bottle. Okay. That uh, people over 60 should be minimized on these meds if they're ever used. And that women should always be given half dose. That's one of Lunesta, it's five milligrams of Ambien or generic Ambien's open in. And Ambien CR comes in two strengths. Again, it should be able to half dose. Dr. Thomas has a Yes, Dr. Thomas. Good morning. Um, quick question. So obviously, and thank this was a I, this was just a fabulous discussion. I really appreciate it. Um, these are these patients are at such high risk um, from uh, an overdose standpoint, and all of you guys are seeing these really high-risk patients. Um, I guess a little bit I feel guilty that I typically don't see these high-risk patients, but I'm just wondering if um, you are typically prescribing or whether these patients have naloxone at home. Do you, I mean, do you see that as part of your uh, necessary intervention when you're sort of catching these patients. They're obviously not your patients primarily, but I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity there for 
an intervention. And I wonder if that intervention might in some way demonstrate to the patients the, um, the acuity of the situation. Uh, you know, I'll comment on that from, you know, my standpoint, I see that, that intervention that going one of two ways. And one, I see, you know, you tell the patient, like, look, you're at high risk, you're on high dose opiates, you're on these other combinations of meds, your chance of overdosing is, you know, is, is high. And so I'm going to give you this medication, and, and I'm going to hopefully, you know, you, you never have to use it, but if, you, if your partner does found you, you know, not breathing in bed, they can give this to you and hopefully save your life. I think that scares some patients straight. They're like, what? Or they may even question, why, then why are you prescribing this stuff to me, even though I've had that conversation like a million times over about how we should reduce it, right? Um, you know, it's all of a sudden like that, that has that moment in time. But I think in you know, my clinic, there's also those other patients that are high risk, but as soon as I give them that, then they see it as their, their ability to push the envelope. Correct. Hey, now I can take more pills, I can uh, have riskier behavior, and, and so I have to say that I, you know, I, I try to follow the CDC guidelines and what's been recommended to a T. But since there's that other half that I know it's going to increase their their behavior, that I haven't given an naloxone prescription yet because um, I'm afraid of of that half. You know, I, I would love to scare everybody straight. If I knew that that's what it would do, I would definitely give a naloxone prescription to everybody I prescribe to. But my fear is that that other half that's going to push the envelope that now I may have put a person that I'm going to push them over the edge with, with that talk because now they think they can be even riskier and they've got something to save their life. Yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, I should follow the CDC guidelines being a pain management doc, but I think my, my, fear, of, my fear of giving somebody naloxone is that I'll, I'll create riskier behavior. Is there some level of morphine equivalent dose that you do feel that it's essential? Oh, I, I think the CDC guidelines are right. Once you get over 50 milligrams, you know, even though there's no safe dose. Right. I mean, that's what the CDC guidelines points out. They, they recommend it once you get over 50 milligrams. So I've kind of put that as a, a, a target. We've talked about it as providers in our clinic, but I think we're just afraid of the, um, uh, you know, patients who are going to, you know, now – even, you know, put themselves more at risk by overtaking their meds. I think we, we've been reluctant to give them the loss. Thank you. No problem. Is there another question? Um, I've got a question. Um, my name is Patty Wise at Southline Medical Center in Yarrington. I'm a PA. Um, and I came in late, so forgive me if you already discussed this. Um, when you were talking about tapering uh, sleepers and Ambien or the benzos and then the opiates, what I was wondering is, um, what hope can I give to my patients that I'm trying to work with them? Because they think they're doing great with all that stuff, and they think taking any one element out is going to be terrible. For example, Soma, everybody loves their Soma. What, how, and they think they're going to be in more pain. And I, all I can do is, I, I, I'm like a police officer. I mean, I'm still trying to help them, so I'm, what, how, what? How can I tell them this is better? What, what, what are they going to get out of it? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I, I find that most of them have gotten into the cycle of, of polypharmacy. And I just start asking them point blank. I say, have you seen a chronic pain specialist? Have you seen a PM&R specialist? Have you seen a physical therapist? Have you tried acupuncture? Have you been to a chiropractor? Uh, you know, what else have you done besides taking pills and seeking pills have you done to try to improve your pain? Have you done an exercise program? Have you gotten a personal trainer? You know, what, what have you done? Have you done any injections? So if they say no, 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 no to all of that, which is often the case, or have you done any of that recently, or have you done any clinical counseling for the psychiatric side of your pain, which is always there? So it's kind of the passive versus right. the active. Right. I say, well, unless you've done those <laughs> things, unless you've found a combination of all of those that helps manage your pain, you're never going to be able to get away from the, you know, the bag of pills. And I, I quite frankly, again, I'm very pragmatic with my patients. I, I try not to talk to them as a physician. I try to give them personal examples. And I use my own personal examples a lot, from family members to other patients to myself. So I have horrible scoliosis and osteoarthritis in my spine. And it gets worse every year. And I hurt every day. And I live with pain every day. And I tell them, I don't take narcotics. And I don't take, you know, benzos. And I don't take, and I'm not going to have back surgery. And, you know, and I stay away from the things that I know are not helpful long-term. 
and I can't function and be here as your doctor or work every day if I'm taking those meds anyway. So what do I do? Well, I see my chiropractor when I need to. I see my physical therapist when I need to. I do exercises that they taught me to do. I see my clinical counselor if I need to because the pain's getting so bad it's not affecting my mood. You know, I, I take anti-inflammatories consistently, so my Celebrex is every day. So I just give them a, here's my regimen. I have to do this every day to be functional. And I've been doing this for 20 years. So you have to go along those same paths. You have to choose some of these healthier choices and behaviors rather than just seeking narcotics or seeking, you know, soma. And I tell them, soma's a narcotic. You call it a muscle relaxer, but it's a narcotic. It metabolizes to a narcotic. So you're taking really an extra narcotic. You're taking these two and these three. And I said, there's absolutely, and I tell them there's no reason, even if you do need narcotics, minimize the dose, therefore minimize the risk, minimize the side effects, uh, including constipation and all these other problems they complain of. And narrow down to one. One. One from each class. Not three, not four. You know, not, you know, I take my fentanyl and my oxycodone and my fentanyl patch and my Dilaudid, puppy lollipops. I mean, that's what I see. And I tell them also that they're putting their doctors in danger. And I talk about the opioid crisis and the epidemic and doctors being arrested. And now that we have, every time we prescribe one of these drugs, we now have to go to a website and check your records. We have to go to the Nevada PMP and prove that you're not abusing these drugs and you're not getting from other sources. And the DEA and the state DEA is tracking your behavior and mine. Mm -hmm. that, boy, that really raises a whole lot of eyebrows. What? Somebody's watching every prescription I get? I say, yep. Yeah. Every single prescription you get, including sleep aids, new vigil, pro vigil, any of these drugs, Schedule 2, they're tracking it. And I have to check it, and I have to document the chart that I checked it every single time I prescribe it, and every one of your doctors has to. So anyone can easily see that you're overusing, over-medicating your disorder. And it's quite easy. And I say the DEA also, and Medicare audits us randomly to see if we're prescribing these things or how much. And we can lose our license over these kinds of behaviors. So it, it, there's just kind of multiple ways to kind of get them to choose healthier lifestyle choices that are lead to less pain. And, you know, use some of your other specialists. So physical medicine rehabilitation is a very useful outlet, and most people don't even know those doctors exist or what they do. And many chronic pain clinics now employ PM&R doctors in their clinics, and renal orthopedic has one, I think now, so it, it's becoming much more mainstream, but it's still a relatively small field. Uh, but we have good people in this region that do very good, and I tell them, they can't do surgery, they can't cut on you, you know, these are not a basic, just like I said, people to him say, he can't give you more meds, he can't prescribe more meds, yeah. he's not going to give you more antidepressants, I promise. So it's just very useful to get them avenues for these resources, and that's what I tell them, I'm here for you as a resource. I know all these resources, I can get you to them, but you've got to follow up. It really, it really sounds like on a fundamental level, you help them move from being a passive recipient of care to a more active seeker of coping strategies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think Dr. Lucia said the right word, it's, it's lifestyle. And these patients have got to buy into it, and it's a lifestyle change. It's, and, and, you know, the example we use in our clinic is kind of like uh, diabetes. You know, you, you don't come in, we're going to prescribe you a pill for your diabetes, and you can do whatever you want. No, if you're a diabetic, you need to change your diet. You need to change your exercise. You need to change, you know, other parts of your life. And maybe a pill is a part of it. And that's the same with pain management. Pain management isn't just giving you more pills. It's more about, hey, how are you going to exercise? How are you going to change what you eat? How are you going you know, to lose weight? How are you going to change other parts of your, you know, your sleep cycle? How are you going to change these things to overall make your pain better? And I think if you use those examples, you know, I think you know, using like blood pressure, diabetes, and how doing other things is going to make a difference, I think then they understand that they have to be more active um, and not be passive and rely on pain medications for, for treatment. I know you're, you're in a small community, and it's more difficult because you have fewer resources. I know that. I practiced in Elko for seven years part-time, and market the limited resources there. But, but many of these you know, rural areas do have rotated folks. They have psychologists that rotate out. They have you know, PMR people that rotate out. So they may not be there all full-time, but they're rotating through. And Could so I make a request? Yes. <laughs> Come on out here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've done my travel time. <laughs> I've my car in four years going to Elko and back. I'm done. You know, if I could add one thing, uh, since he may not be able to come out there, I, I have learned about what I, I heard as the Lucia 7. The seven things that I think he looks for in terms of looking at sleep, disruptive apnea, 
uh, or sleep apnea and, and the patient you're seeing. And if, if, could you uh, maybe talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, there, there are many screening tools. Maybe trying to screen for sleep apnea, you really should. In, in these, all these, especially these pain and insomnia patients. If they come to you complaining of insomnia, most of the time that's, there's a sleep disorder underlying that. And, and at least half those patients have sleep apnea as the cause of their insomnia. And you can use the stop bang questionnaire, which has been well publicized in the anesthesia literature and so forth. And I find it reasonably useful. And you can use that for the scores that ask people how sleep they are. Those were not that reliable. But you know, the simplest way I found to do it and teach residents to do this is look at three symptoms, you know, snoring or not, especially chronic snoring, witness apnea or any irregular breathing pattern, uh, and then fatigue or sleepiness. Because a lot of people don't say they're sleepy, they say they're tired, yeah. they're fatigued. So either one counts as a symptom. So those are kind of the three hallmark symptoms. They have two or three of those, high risk. Then look at simple physical exam findings. All I need to see, it, I can walk to any restaurant, any room, and look around and tell you who has sleep apnea in about 10 seconds, especially if they open their mouth and talk, because then I can get a mountain potty score. So <laughs> look at their mouth, and look at their mountain potty score. So if they have a mountain potty three or four, I mean, all you can see is a tongue and the roof of their mouth, super high risk. So each increase in mountain potty score doubles the risk of apnea from one to a four. Look at their neck size, just put a tape measure around their neck. Because most people here don't wear collared shirts and don't know their, their collar size like I do. But I can, like the guests are at the fair, I can pretty much tell people's BMI and their neck size from across the room. So especially neck size. I'm pretty good at neck size now. I'm good within a half inch almost every time. But just do a tape measure. If their neck is more than 16 inches as a male, more than 14 inches as a woman, high risk. And to add that to your score. And then look at the BMI. So again, 23% of patients are not obese. But if they are obese, and the BMI is above 30, certainly above 35, Again, that's a huge risk factor. So if your BMI is above 30, your neck's above 16 inches as a male, you've got chronic snoring, so you know, three physical exam findings, three symptoms, and then number seven is comorbidities. So that post I mentioned, yeah. it used to have three or four comorbidities, AFib, hypertension, you know, now it's 40 different comorbidities. I can't even fit it on the form anymore. So I just say, if you have any of the things on that poster and three or four of these other findings, that's all I need. And you've got a 98% chance of having moderate to severe sleep apnea, and we should move forward at least with a screening study at home. So it, it, just look at the basic, and even the CDL requirements, the DOT physically that we have to do now, the, the medical examiner, they even included in the 2014 update with all of these findings. So it's actually more progressive than any insurance companies or even Medicare. And it lists, you've got to look at the mild body score, you look at the craniofacial anatomy, you look at a recessed jaw, a small jaw, and more detailed even than what I just told you. Uh, but it all adds up to how crowded is the airway. And independent of whether they're obese or not, if you see those findings, they should be screened. So uh, next size, if you are a truck driver and you have more than a 16-inch neck, got to have sleep study. Got to have sleep study if you want to keep your CDL. So regardless of symptoms, they don't care if you snore or not, you have to have sleep study. So it's just important to look for the easy findings instead of trying to kind of spend all this time getting this elaborate history. Do you snore? How often do you snore? Has anybody heard you stop breathing? You know, and try to get, do I sleep during the day? Fall asleep at a stoplight? Yeah, those cases are out there, but quite frankly, it's, it's too labor intensive to get all that history, and it's really irrelevant. Get the, fi get the findings, look at the physical exam findings. You can do that in two seconds. Your MAs weighed them and got their height, you've got a BMI in your chart already if you've got an electronic record. Get them to just add doing an exercise to your patients when they check them in especially if they're overweight or they have a thick trunk look, and then just look in their mouth. Look in their mouth, see what the mouth body score. And remember, when you do the mouth body, do not use a tongue blade. Stick the tongue out, open the mouth, shine the light in, no pushing the tongue down with the tongue blade, and let them keep the mouth open for about five seconds and tell them to relax their throat. Tongue out to relax the throat, and don't say ah, because when you say ah, what do you do? You tighten up your palate, mm -hmm. and you raise the palate. And so that's what the cause of snoring and most of the apnea is. So you say, open your mouth, relax your throat. And what you'll see is they open, and initially the palate goes up, and then if they hold it open, the palate just drapes down like a curtain. And now it's laying on the tongue. And the tongue's there, and the palate and you are lying on the tongue. That's about body four. That person's got apnea, no question. So it's a simple but super effective way to kind of screen patients very, very quickly for apnea. So, I, you know, as a pain management specialist, sleep is a huge issue, and, you know, we have certain rules and regulations in our clinic, like one, we, we would never prescribe a sleep aid, 
um, Ambien or any of those. Two, we never prescribe any benzodiazepines. Three, we won't prescribe some. Um, and, and so a lot of times what I find is I'm looking at what the patient comes to me and I'm utilizing those meds for sleep. And so I, I just want to get your opinion on this. So number one would be sometimes I use Cizanidine. I'm also relaxing at bedtime, you know, four milligrams, one or two at bedtime. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, it's certainly safer than, again, the, the sleep drugs. And I see patients, a lot of patients on that. And I don't push hard to get them off that as much as the other more dangerous drugs. Um, and if there is a lot of fibromyalgia type muscle pain and, and tension, it may, it may work or it may help. So I'm okay with that in most cases as long as they're not getting the daytime hangover effect the next morning. And if they do have restless legs or PLMD, those drugs can help treat that too. So we actually use benzos to treat people with PLMD. A lot of these patients get very quick movements of sleep. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, I think that's a lesser of many evils, that's for sure. What about like TCAs, that class? Uh, tricyclics like Kilovil and so forth, I, I really try to stay away from. Okay. Um, the reason being is that they definitely really alter the sleep pattern, and they definitely severely suppress REM sleep, uh, and they have lots of anticholinergic side effects and overdose potential. So I really try not to use any tricyclics at all just because they overdose potential. And it only takes a small amount of tricyclic when you mix it with all those other drugs, again, to get cardiac arrhythmias and risk of death. But I tell them that, so these drugs are associated with high risk of overdose-related death. Um, and tricyclics increase restless legs and PLMs. Okay. So do SSRIs. Okay. So antidepressants, tricyclics, uh, these are drugs that increase a lot of sleep disorders, increase restless legs, and, and critical leg movements of sleep. They don't make sleep apnea worse, but they definitely can make insomnia worse okay. because of that. So you're getting it, but it's a dating effect that it will induce leg movements or other problems that actually make the sleep worse. So I, I really try to get people off Elevil and any other tricyclics, especially if you're using it as a sleep drug. They're going to take it for other reasons, take it in the morning. Okay. What about like uh, gabapentin, pre or the long-acting gabapentin? Yeah, I mean, you know, those have been the least studied of all the drug classes we've talked about this morning. Those are the least studied <laughs> when it comes to sleep. Uh, what we do know is that there's a general sedating effect on brainwave patterns of sleep. There's generally a suppression of REM. There's some data suggesting increased sleep apnea if it's untreated by the, the muscle relaxant effect, depending on the dose. The biggest issue I have with those is how much they throw people's circadian rhythm off, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is that if it makes them profoundly sleepy during the day and then they sleep during the day, then it's almost impossible to get them on a normal sleep pattern at night. And we do know that gabapentin and those drugs, lyric and all these, pregabalin, they affect melatonin release. There's no question. Okay. And they, they definitely affect the normal melatonin cycle. So they can induce melatonin release at the wrong time of day. So that it doesn't happen at 11 o'clock at night. And again, that's why I think the chronotherapy of those drugs is more important than, than using them or not when they take them. So the long-acting gabapentin that's out there, would you prefer patients be on that versus gabapentin you know, yes. three times a day? Yes. Okay. So that would be it. Yes. Because we see, I think, with less sedating effect, I think we see less peaks and valleys and their melatonin secretion and abnormal rhythms. What about um, SNRIs, like some Volta? Do you, do you like that? They're better than just SSRIs in terms of the effects on sleep, uh, and they're less likely to cause you know, daytime sedation. So if they're going to need to be on an antidepressant, yes, that's right. Okay. I try to stay away from the first generation drugs like Prozac and so forth, and even second generation. They're the most damaging. Also, they cause the most weight gain, the third in apnea, that's a problem. So if you get into third generation or, or later, SSRIs or SNRIs, then that's a better choice. Mm -hmm. And But those two can induce the leg movement problem. Mm -hmm. So if we diagnose that, then we look at trying to get on alternative treatments for the depression or, or even if it's part of the pain management. Okay. Any class of drugs that I'm missing that you would say, hey, if you're going to prescribe something for sleep, this is what I'd recommend? Uh, I'll say if you're going to prescribe something for sleep, this is what I never recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Prescribing president for sleep. That's the biggest mistake I see in this region. It's nationwide it's a problem. It's particularly bad in Northern Nevada. It's a, it's a primary care habit that just continues to persist and persist and persist. And in that Consumer Reports article, the lead of one of the paragraphs is trazodone, not for sleep, ever. And the reason is the sedating effects, daytime hangover effects, constipation, prostatism. When I see people get catheters put in their bladder because they got acute prostatism from taking one dose trazodone. 
I've seen people who I saw a patient who took a dose and ended up in the ER. She was so confused and thought she was a drug overdose and she was incoherent for almost 36 hours after one dose of trastuzumab because she was taking other drugs. Yeah. And she got a DUI because of it. She was in the ER. I mean, it was horrible. Uh, they thought she was having epilepsy fits, all this stuff. So especially the elderly. God, people over the age of 65 who take trastuzumab, it's massively impairing to them. So I would say that's the one thing I steer patients completely away from. Uh, if they're going to do something, taking supplemental melatonin is probably the safest thing that they can take. However, most people take it incorrectly. They take too large a dose and they take it at bedtime. That's not how you take melatonin. You have to take melatonin at three hours before the natural melatonin peak. So your melatonin levels peak between 10 and 11 p.m. every night. And if you, because of the blood-brain barrier, it takes a long time when you take oral melatonin for it to get into the blood and into the CSF, which is what you're trying to do. Three hours. So I so tell you, eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock is the right time to take melatonin. Seven to eight, and not more than one to three milligrams. One to three. Milligrams. And there are five and ten milligram supplements out there being sold over the counter. You take ten milligrams of melatonin, especially at bedtime, it kicks in three hours later than it was supposed to. You get a paradoxical hyperarousal, mm-hmm. just like hyperalgesia. With the, so you can actually make insomnia worse with high dose melatonin at the wrong time. So instead, one to three milligrams at one for women, two to three for men at 8 p.m. Okay. And it works better if it's taken consistently for these two to three weeks, and then try to stop it or take it intermittently. You get a pattern of enhancing the melatonin secretion every night at the same time. Okay. And that's something that's a fairly easy sell for patients. Yeah. And it's cheap. I tell them to go to Costco and buy Kirkland brand because it's USP, so it's, it's, it's got the same pharmaceutical grade. And it's made in the same factory, and it's, it's your pharmaceuticals, so you know what you're getting. Okay. And you're getting a consistent dose every time. Does the melatonin have those same possible effects of people with dementia? You know, no. Those, no, no, it does not. Not unless they take really high dose. So if they take 8, 10 milligrams, yes, it can definitely cause hangover effects the next day, definitely can cause cognitive impairment, yes. So that's why the dosing is so important. Too much, it's definitely a problem. Uh, the other problem, they can interact with Coumadin. So you got to watch Coumadin. If patients are Coumadin and use melatonin, especially if you get above a very low dose, you can extend their protons. Otherwise, there's very few drug interactions you have to worry about. Unlike Ambien and these other drugs that have 50 different interactions. So and it's nice to give patients at least some tool. Like when you talk to your patient and you're trying to get them off that sleeper, and they say, well, then what am I going to do? You know, they catastrophize, of course, about it. This is a, a relatively safe alternative to give them to give them a plan. You give them a sleep diary, you can sleep hygiene tips, you say here's the melatonin, you can buy it over the counter, you have a prescription get this, you can get it anywhere. You know, I sell it in my office here, go buy it at the front counter, I can buy it and just go get the Costco stuff and say, here, this is what I want you to take. Um, then it, it gives them a plan. And it's not this I don't have anything to do, I'm just gonna later all night all night not sleep. Just don't, don't take a second dose, don't take it again at bedtime, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, take another dose of melatonin, that doesn't work. So, but also you've got to get away from the stimulant medications that are causing your insomnia too. So again, we get sleep diaries, we get food diaries, you know, you know what's the latest in the day you drink caffeine? You know, well, they're coming home and getting their Starbucks. I, you know, I drive by the new Starbucks off Rob Drive every day, coming home at six o'clock, and there's a line out the door <laughs> at six o'clock at night. Then there's 15 cars in the drive-thru. I'm like, holy crap, who's going to Starbucks at 6.30 at night to get their double frap of cappuccino? We know this like, and they wonder why they can't sleep. You know, and I see 12 year old kids in there getting caffeinated beverages with their mom or dad. So you really got to ask about those lifestyle things because people really don't really understand the impacts of those things. Caffeine's in your brain for six plus hours after the last dose. And that's the half point. <coughs> so they no caffeine after 2 p.m. And that's the person start there. I have a question, please. Um, from what I remember under fibromyalgia syndrome, that Elevil is the number one medication for that to help sleep. Do you have any comments regarding that or a decreased dose of Elevil? I mean, I'm with you. I mean, I've always been taught that Elevil is the go-to medication for fibromyalgia. And so a lot of times for sleep, I'll put them on like 10 milligrams. And if it's ineffective, then I'll have them double up to 20 or give them a prescription for 25 the next month. So that's why I'm fascinated. That's why I asked you earlier about different classes of medications that I use, utilize to see. And so, yeah. But if that dose, you're not going to see nearly 
that's not the dose I see used. Though. Okay. Okay. When somebody comes to me at Elevate, they're using you know, triple that. Okay. Or quadruple that. And then at that dose, you clearly are going to get all these side effects I mentioned, potential for overdose and the increased leg movements. If you use really low dose, like 10 milligrams, then no. Well, I don't have a concern about that. Okay. There's minimal effect on sleep pattern with that. So just minimize it. Yes. Oh. But very low dose. But I don't see that. People who come to me are on 100 milligrams. No. You know, these kinds of doses and the potential there again for side effects and overdose is tremendous. Okay. So. So one of the things we can do is to post the link to the Consumer Reports article yeah. Yeah. Um, on the ECHO website. So is that the, can you get hooked on over-the-counter sleep aids? Is that the article you were referring to, or is that? That's one of them, yeah. They did. They've done three in the last two years. Okay, so we'll post all of them on the website. Uh, so I will uh, we'll get that together later. Yeah, yeah. Send me a link. Yeah, it's easy. And, you know, it's easy to photocopy that. I have a copy in all my rooms. I do a double side copy at the bottom of it. It actually has, you know, 10 tips for better sleep. Yeah. Talks about sleep hygiene, all the things people do wrong that, that leads to insomnia. And at the very end, there's even a nice blurb on cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT for insomnia as the most effective long-term strategy and a way of avoiding medications. I, I push that very hard, and I refer a lot for CBT, a lot. And we do have people in Reno that do, that do CBT for insomnia, psychologists that specialize in this, uh, like Michael and others, Dr. Gentry in town, Ruth Gentry. Uh, but again, the big impediment has been in rural areas, there's not as much access to resources. But they're out there. You just have to stand. Even in Oklahoma, I had psychologists that rotated out there uh, that would do CBT for my insomnia patients. Is there any other questions before we finish up? Well, I just, I have a real quick one. When we're talking about lifestyle changes and passive versus, at, versus active, um, when I'm looking at lifestyle changes, I usually have a partner or somebody, a loved one in there for a couple of the sessions, uh, not only for support, but also to keep the person accountable. Right. Do you uh, also Absolutely. recommend that? Absolutely. Yeah, I want, I want the bed partner there. Mm -hmm. Uh, spouse, bed partner, whoever, I, I want them there. And if the patient comes by himself, I tell them, please bring your spouse for the next visit. Even if I don't see that, when we treat the sleep apnea and things get better, I want their perspective on how you're sleeping, how you're using your sleep apnea, what medications you're using, what's your sleep schedule like, what's is your shift work, you know, what's going on in the house. You know, is she working shift work and he's not, but he's getting up with her. You know, these are all factors that yeah, it's really helpful to get another perspective. Chronic pain is a relationship problem. Right. Yes, it is. Well, I was going to say, a lot of times that I see it's like it's yeah. either got an enabler yeah. or I've got a codependent. Yep. And so they, yep. they protect them. And so even though I try to intervene, then, you know, that's not even like, okay, but that's right. Right. right? Trying to protect or enable them. But I need here. Well, I'd like to thank you for, the for coming in today. I hope it was a, a valuable session. It sure seemed like it. Nice interaction. And uh, thank you all, and have a great uh, have a great month. We'll see you back in a month. Thank you very much, Thanks, everybody. This yes. was a great session.